The USSR, a state driven by paranoia that gathers masses of information about everything and everyone. But if you're paranoid, you tend to only believe what you want to believe. Distrust the leads to spies, spying on spies. At some point, you distrust so much that you purge the spies and kill them. So you need new spies and new spies spying on the new spies, creating the biggest and possibly most dysfunctional espionage organization in human history. Hello, darlings. This is Spies and Ties, a sub-series of World War II in real time, and I am Astrid Deinhardt. Okay, I said dysfunctional, but they do some things right, which German commander Friedrich Paulus in Stalingrad is learning the hard way in 1942. Whatever Paulus does, it seems like the Soviets already know that he will do it before he does it. It seems that way because they do know. You see, the entire Soviet political and military system is based on intelligence about everything. Spies and informants everywhere, from daily life to the military. After all, you're already considered a counter-revolutionary if you, for example, listen to the wrong music, wear the wrong clothes, even drinking Coca-Cola is a sign that you're a traitor. Organizations like the Pay Attention, GRU, that's Russian, so I don't know what that means, but it is the Military Chief Intelligence Directorate of the Supreme Command. And the Interior Ministry, NKVD, just a sec, I really have to know what that means in Russian. I'll call Rune, if that's okay with you. <clears throat> We have short numbers here. Uh, Rune? Oh, hello, Astrid. Hi. There's, here's the thing. What is GRU in Russian? And what is NKVD in Russian? Главное разведывательное управление. GU. Главное okay. управление. Uh -huh. Right? That makes it easier a, a bit. Okay, and NKVD? Народный комиссариат. I will not repeat anything. No, 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 I can't, re <laughs> I can't repeat that. But thanks a lot. See you soon. Okay, right? Bye-bye, love. <clears throat> okay, so that is the secret police of the NKVD and the GU. They have huge networks of informants and spies spitting out thousands of reports which flow all the way to the top. Because in the Red Army, every soldier is expected to contribute to map out every single detail from gun positions, weapon types to defensive measures, and of course, judgment of enemy strength. Outside of the Soviet Union, they can easily recruit agents from millions of communists, more loyal to the ideology than their own national government. So, the handlers and diplomats working for the GRU, no, GU, soon have a vast network for foreign informants and spies all over the world. Moscow provides large sums of money, training, and piles of advanced equipment. It's hard to say how many spies there were exactly, but it's many dozens of cells relying on thousands of people. We have already covered some of them, like the Soviet spy network around Leopold Trapper that runs in France and Belgium, Arvid Harnack and Harold schulze boysen resistance cells in Germany, and many other German, Dutch, French, Belgium, Greek, Italian, British, and American citizens offer their services to the Soviets, big and small. Hmm. What? British and Americans, you say? But aren't they allied to the USSR? Well, yes. But that doesn't stop Stalin's spies. As I said, they're really paranoid, and until German invasion, they are the potential enemy, more than Germany. In Britain, 
for example, 20 spies are recruited by the Austrian chemist Arnold Deutsch, codename Otto. Here he is, operating from London. Five of them will gain fame as the Cambridge Five, who all, who would have guessed, all studied in hmm? Cambridge. Yes. One of these five is Harold Philby, codenamed Kim, recruited in 1934. He works as a journalist covering military developments on the continent and then returns to England and joins M. I-6, where he becomes one of Moscow's most successful moles. Another Cambridge Five agent is art historian Anthony Blunt. He starts working for MI5 in 1940, eventually going to the decryption center in Bletchley Park. The whole system depends on expanding the network by agents recruiting agents. So Blunt recruits John Cancross. Here he is who becomes the private secretary of Lord Hankey, who sits on the so-called Maud Committee. That's a name, and they thought that was funny. Part of the British Atomic Weapons Program, Kane Cross copies and steals whatever he can from Hankey's documents and informs Moscow that the Western allies are, guess what? Building the bomb. Now, all they have to do in Moscow is flip through their secret Rolodex to find someone else who can provide them even with more information. And they find him, and here he is. German-born British physicist Klaus Fuchs, a refugee from, from the Nazis already in 1933. He becomes a British citizen in 42 and soon gets top secret clearance to work on the Tube Alloys program, the British heart of the British nuclear arms program. What his employers don't know is that Fuchs is a communist, willing to work for the Soviet cause. Through a friend, he meets the Soviet military attaché in London and becomes a GU agent. So, now Stalin has even more information flowing. In 1943, Fuchs will transfer to the, hold your shorts, American Manhattan Project. And guess what? Presto! The Soviets have access to the US data as well. But they can get more directly from America. Back to the Rolodex. This time, the Soviet spy master in the US, Semyon Semyonov, provides a new entry to Manhattan. In September 1942, Semyonov gets help by a high ranking member of the US Communist Party to recruit an engineer with communist sympathies. Julius Rosenberg, who is working at the Army Signal Corps Engineering Laboratories. Not only does Rosenberg get the Soviets thousands of documents about radar, signaling and radio technology, he also recruits five more agents. And his wife, Secretary Ethel Rosenberg, starts handling the information flow. Ethel also a communist, of course, has a brother, David Greenglass, who is a communist. And guess where he's working? The Manhattan Project, of course. Soon, he too is working for the NKVD and GU, and he's not alone. In all five spies are known to have infiltrated the Manhattan Project, but the Soviets make sure they don't know of each other. Fuchs will be uncovered in the 1949 and Greenglass will be caught up in the arrest of the Rosenbergs in 1950. But the other three will go undetected until researchers uncover evidence of their existence in the 1990s. And then it gets cold out there, right? It's a bit more complicated to spy on the Germans. After all, they are the enemy and experience expecting Soviet espionage. So the Soviets concentrate on setting up networks from outside of Germany. One of them is Hungarian cartographer Alexander Rado. Here he is. He moved to Switzerland in 1939. In 41, he enters service in the GU, running a radio signaling network codename DORA. Rado 
has sources that run deep into the German military command, but also coordinates with double agents in Western Europe. In early 42, Rado is the first to reveal the plans of Fallblau, the attack towards the Caucasus, based on information from French intelligence officer Georges Blanc. As always, the Gestapo are on Blanc's and Rado's heels as the Swiss detachment of the Rote Kapelle. After Trapper's network is rolled up it is Rado's crew that takes over as the leading Soviet intelligence cell in Europe. Gestapo calls them die Rote Drei, the Red Three. One of Rado's sources is German refugee Rudolf Rössler, codename Lucy. He's not a spy himself, but has amazing sources. Unfortunately, we don't know who they are and neither did the Soviets. Well, that's how you do it, right? One theory is that the British used Lucy as a tool to get decrypted messages to the Soviets without having to explain how they got them. That would be a cool story, but it looks more like he just had many friends who were anti-Nazi officers in the German army. In fact, it's likely that one of them was our friend Hans Oster. Abwehr head Wilhelm Canaris second in command. But being a spy for the Soviets can be dangerous. Not only because you might get caught, your employer might very well decide they don't trust you any longer and simply get rid of you, like forever. For example, Arnold Deutsch, codename Otto, that I mentioned before, the Austrian Kamets who recruited the Cambridge Five, well, Otto dies in November 42 in a maritime incident in the North Atlantic. Further investigation by a journalist suggests that he was actually purged by the Soviets. So, obviously, if you don't trust the source, you can't trust the intelligence either, right? So, if Otto is suspect, so are all his recruits. And in fact, many of the thousands of reports from the Cambridge Five are left unopened in the drawers of NKVD officials because how would a communist ever get a higher profile position in the British intelligence service, right? That's suspicious. Moscow is so convinced they can't be real agents that they sent on eight-man surveillance team to London to spy on the spies, who find nothing. But finding no evidence doesn't always satisfy the Soviets. A lot of their intelligence reporting is based on wishful thinking or a desire to please the boss. Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin. For instance, when the reports of an upcoming German invasion start coming in en masse in early 41, Philip Golnikov, director of the GU, does report them to Stalin, but labels them mm, doubtful and underlines his trust in German restraint. Because as we know from Stalin himself, he doesn't want to believe that the Germans are coming. Think of my spy and tie video about our friend Sam and Erwin, who tried big time. And there's good reason to make sure you keep Uncle Joe happy. Why is that? Golikov's seven predecessors were all relieved of their duties and killed. During the Great Terror and military purges between 1935 and 38, Stalin literally hollowed out the GU, killing his way through the ranks from director Jan Karlovich Bursin down to the cooks in the cantina. It's all part of the power dynamic that originated right after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Intelligence is seen as such a powerful tool that anyone wielding it is believed to be a threat themselves, especially to the leadership, including Stalin. It's a circular argument because it's exactly this information that Stalin uses to purge the ranks. But at some point, 
the informant will inevitably know too much and must themselves be perched. It makes the intelligence network of the USSR terribly inefficient, but it also makes the USSR a counterintelligence superpower. Distrust, manipulation and scrutiny are woven into the fabric of Soviet society and its military. One author describes the Soviet Union as a conspiracy disguised as a state. So, in the 1940s, since 20 years, its security organizations have been doing little but catch spies, traitors, and dissidents. Real or imagined, it does make it near impossible for anyone, Germans or allies, to successfully infiltrate the Soviets. If like the Soviets, you want to know more about the US-British efforts to build the bomb? Check out Indy's video about the Manhattan Project here and my video about the German Atomic Project here. And make sure to join our not-so-secret organization, the Time Ghost Army, at patreon.com or timeghost.tv to make sure we can build a global network of history. See you next time, darlings. Mm -hmm.